Game of Thrones is back, baby. Yes, that's right. Today we are talking about House of the Dragons Season 2, Episode 2. And I honestly think that House of the Dragons might just be peak Game of Thrones. Hello everyone, I'm Finn. Welcome back to Finn Films. Join me today as we discuss everything that happened in Season 2, Episode 2 of House of the Dragon. An episode where Helena is mentally broken, Aegon throws a tenter tantrum, and the twin brothers Eric and Eric have their epic, heartbreaking duel to the death. So season two, episode two of House of the Dragons opens immediately following the events of the climax of episode one, the events of Blood and Cheese, the bloody assassination of King Aegon's son, Prince Jaehaerys. An assassination gone wrong, an assassination originally intended for Aemon Targaryen after he brutally, if not, I guess, accidentally killed his nephew, Lucerys Valarian, the son of a Rhaenyra Targaryen. We have to also remember that the pacing of the show has also slowed dramatically compared to season one. Season one very much being a kind of like setup, kind of prequel to this grand civil war, the Dance of the Dragons. Season two of House of the Dragons takes place literally four or five days post the events of uh, Aegon's coronation. And this is very, very important for reasons we're going to discuss in this video. So as we've seen in the beginning of our episode, things have gone to absolute shit in the Red Keep after the assassination of Prince Jaehaerys. King Aegon has absolutely lost his shit. In a very kind of dramatic moment, we see him destroying his father's model set, a model set that he had taken the entire first season. We saw King Viserys putting this together, and literally within a minute, we see his son King Aegon destroy the entire thing. This really is an important and kind of interesting scene as it is a really symbolic nature on the kind of change of rulers from King Viserys, this very wise, patient, if not viewed as weak man to his son, King Aegon, a rash, just absolute hothead of a young boy, a boy who in one fell swoop destroys all in many ways, the life work of his father. This really is kind of this symbolic moment of the changing of the guard, the fact that King Viserys is no longer the king anymore. There is a new king in town, and man, is he absolutely unhinged. Aemon puts things together extremely quickly. He puts things together right away that this assassination was meant for him, an assassination in revenge for the death of Luke, and an assassination most likely put together by his uncle, Daemon Targaryen. I talked about this in my video for everything that happened in episode one of uh, House of the Dragons. Make sure you go check that video out. But there's tons of foreshadowing throughout these episodes, foreshadowing for future events, future very epic events of this War of the Dance of the Dragons. And uh, a big part of this foreshadowing is this eventual face-off between Aemon and Daemon that is teased constantly uh, throughout season two and even towards the end of uh, season one. But we're going to be discussing more about that later. As well, just to note later on, I will be discussing a few, I guess, spoilers per se for or fire and blood in relation to a couple of characters, characters that are more fleshed out in this episode. Don't worry, I'll put time scamps on screen if you want to avoid spoilers, just make sure you pay attention to those. So the small council convenes, we see that Aegon, again, he has absolutely lost his shit, and of course he would as his son was just brutally murdered, Aegon putting the blame on his sister Rhaenyra Targaryen, and you can understand why he might think that this was the works of Rhaenyra. Unfortunately for Rhaenyra though, this was not exactly her plan. Plan. Aegon wants blood, declaring the war has now started, but his uncle Otto Hightower, the Hand of the King, being the scheming, conniving, politically minded man he is, has another idea. As a great man once said, a crisis is an opportunity that should not be wasted, and Otto knows this, deciding to use this crisis, the assassination of the prince, to his advantage, holding this idea of a funeral procession, displaying Jaehaerys' body and the works that have been done, and pinning the blame of the death on to Rhaenyra Targaryen. To motivate the small folk to their side, to dismiss all of these claims of Aegon as an usurper, and in order to pin the blame on Rhaenyra, to paint her as a kinslayer and a slayer of children. And man, does this propaganda technique work? Though I have to say it probably comes at the cost of the mental sanity for both Alicent Hightower as well as the uh, prince's mother, Elena Targaryen. Elena, as I said in my episode one breakdown, is basically mentally broken at this point, having witnessed the death of her son, being forced to choose between her two children uh, to die, she's basically absolutely lost it. She was already somewhat mentally unhinged already to some degree, a, bit, a little bit mentally unstable, 
table. But really, from this point forward, uh, Elena, at least in the story Fire and Blood, and I imagine in the on-screen adaption for House of the Dragon, has very much lost it a little bit, and you can't really blame her for the trauma that she has gone through, now having to sit in a funeral procession behind the dead body of her son as a propaganda tool from her great-grandfather. Grandfather, not great-grandfather. We flash over to Dragonstone where Rhaenyra learns of the death of Prince Jaehaerys. This is a massive blow to the credibility for Rhaenyra, as right now both sides are trying to rally the lords to their side, as well as the common small folk to their side, and this is a massive propaganda blow for Rhaenyra. Damon, though, ex basically accepts no responsibility for this, saying that this was basically an accident, even though he did tell the assassins a son for a son. This is a very good, awesome scene, a standoff between Rhaenyra and Damon. Rhaenyra saying that she's never been able to trust Damon. Damon, as well, is a loose cannon of a character. There's a lot of really similarities between Damon and Rhaenyra. In many ways, they are the same person. They are the same character, the major difference being their sex. Damon, because he's a man in this world, can basically do whatever he wants without repercussions. Damon, as well, is still suffering from the grief of having lost not only his brother, but having lost his birthright, the heir to the throne. And the process of accepting that is a hard one. And we see that Damon, being very much his own man, being a bit of a loose cannon, uh, a bit of a morally dubious character, we shall say, is willing to act and uh, use violence to get whatever he wishes. Although his intentions might be good to some degree we see that oftentimes um not good things come of Damon's intentions and Damon's actions as we saw throughout all of season one where Damon was constantly um out of favor with his brother the king and we understand that why uh, ultimately King Viserys chose Rhaenyra to be the heir as Damon while he might have been a good king it probably would have been a bit of an unhinged king Damon, though, in his fury after his argument with Rhaenyra, decides to leave Dragonstone, mounting his dragon in full armor, heading off to Harrenhal to ultimately begin the war and to claim Harrenhal as a base of operations on the Westerosi mainland for the ultimate battle of the Dance of the Dragons between the Blacks and the Greens. We flash back over to King's Landing and our spotlight drops on Sir Criston Cole. Now, Cole is a very interesting dichotomy of a character. The man both views himself as, like, chaste and holy and acts like he takes these vows, these vows of the Kingsguard and the vows of knighthood super important, but he is very much a hypocrite. He is very much a sinner, a man who has committed many, many wrongs, broken many, many oaths, yet he still seems to hold himself to these high standards and very much has a, a sense of guilt, especially guilt over the night of the assassination of Jaehaerys, as where was the commander of the Kingsguard whenever the prince was assassinated? Well, he was f***ing Allison. We see Cole kind of struggle to deal with the consequences of his actions. As we said, he is a very much a hypocrite, ultimately taking out his anger on Sir Eric, one of the twins, the twins who currently is aligned with the Greens. First, Cole chastises Eric for having his uh, white cloak be dirty, as the white cloak is supposed to be a symbol of their kind of chastity, their purity, something that Cole is very much not. This is very much projection from Sir Kristen Cole, very much a projection of his own guilt, ultimately sending Sir Eric on a death mission after basically questioning his loyalty, sending Eric to Dragonstone in order to assassinate Queen Rhaenyra, having Eric disguised as his brother Eric in order to gain entry, ultimately setting up one of the most iconic moments in Westeros in Game of Thrones lore in Fire and Blood, the eventual duel between the two brothers, but we're going to get to that later. We flash over to a really short scene of Prince Aemon in the brothel, a very, very interesting scene, a scene that I was really, really glad that they added here as it gives us a little more context into Aemon's mind, and goddamn is that boy skinny. The most interesting thing here, besides being more foreshadowing, more teasing, between this face-off between uh, Aemon and Damon is Damon lamenting the loss in the business of the death of his um, his nephew, Luke. We see very much here some remorse within Aemon. He is not this cruel, heartless person, this crass person that he very much acts like he is. He's still kind of a little boy at heart, this little boy that was bullied by his family members. If we remember back into season one, Aemon was very much bullied by his family members for being different. Uh, Aemon never literally living down this kind of uh, shame that he felt, this uh, this lack of belonging that he felt, and ultimately uh, Luke ended up paying the price. The scene with Aemon ending with the prostitute 
saying to him that the anger of princes is ultimately felt by the small folk and people around them, something that we very much see in this war, as the show does a really good job giving us perspective on just how this war between these two families is affecting the ultimately the small folk, the majority of the people of Westeros, as we see the people in King's Landing very much struggling from the blockade and the lack of supplies that is happening. From here we are introduced and get more context on a group of very interesting characters between Hugh the Hammer as well as the two brothers Adam and Alan of Hull. If you want to avoid spoilers on who these three characters are as they are very important to the ultimate story of the Dance of the Dragons that is to come, then skip to the time on screen down below. So the one thing that these three characters have in common, Hugh, Adam, and Alan, is that they are all bastards. They are all dragon seeds, meaning they all have Valarian or Targaryen blood in them somehow, which makes them dragon seeds, aka they have the ability to ride dragons. This is important in upcoming episodes when both sides ultimately put out the call for more dragon riders. Um, Alan of Hull as well as Hugh the Hammer both becoming dragon riders in our story, both riding dragons in the Great War of the Dance of the Dragons and having important roles to come in our story. We're not going to go into too much detail here on these characters, but just know that they are very important and ultimately two of them end up being dragon riders themselves and playing an important role in this battle between dragons, battle between the greens and the blacks. We flash back over to King's Landing where we see that Aegon has made a very rash decision, having hung every single rat catcher in King's Landing as payment for the death of his son in order to eliminate the conspirator that ultimately killed his son. I mentioned this in my review of the first episode, but this is basically the catalyst for all of the cats being in uh, King's Landing. If we remember back to Game of Thrones, all of the cats in the Red Keep, as now the cats are the new rat catchers of King's Landing, and this was done because Aegon hung them all, a decision that his grandfather Otto Hightower thinks is really stupid. Again, Aegon is rash, Aegon is quick to anger. Aegon wants revenge he wants blood and as quickly as they gained support from the small folk with the funeral procession they immediately lost it the following day with Aegon's actions having these rat catchers hung and then their bodies displayed from the walls Otto begins chastising his grandson the king as he rightly should as again Aegon is rash Aegon is making decisions that are ultimately bad for his position bad for the crown and bad for the greens in the long run but he does not have the foresight the wisdom to see this Ultimately, him and his uncle getting into a spat, Otto Hightower even acknowledging that King Viserys basically didn't choose him to be king, and they very much did a little coup in order to install Aegon on the throne, Aegon deciding to remove his grandfather Otto as Hand of the King, giving it to Kristen Cole. Kristen Cole becoming the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard and the Hand of the King in a span of five days. What a come up from our boy Kristen Cole. All the meanwhile... Aegon's mom all every single night. Nice. The final 10 minutes of our show is dedicated to one of the most hyped, one of the most iconic, and one of the most heartbreaking moments in the Dance of the Dragons in Game of Thrones lore, the bloody duel between the two twin brothers, Sir Arik and Sir Eric. I absolutely love these scenes. These two actors absolutely nailed it. They absolutely killed it as we see Arik sneak into Dragonstone disguised as his brother, ultimately making his way into Rhaenyra's chamber where he means to kill her, but is stopped by his twin brother. Then we get this really bloody face-off, man. The sword fight was absolutely great. The choreography was great. The emotion from the two actors was top, top tier. These guys did an amazing, amazing job portraying this. This really gives off kind of Civil War vibes as this very much this battle between Eric and Eric this battle between twin brother these two brothers who very much love each other and very much were combined in their goals to you know be these kind of virtuous honorable knights and have now found themselves pitted against each other for the whims of two higher up rulers this battle between the two brothers is very much kind of a metaphor for ultimately the war that is to come and the death and the heartbreak that is to follow when Targaryens go to war against one another. These scenes were absolutely fantastic and were an amazing way to really cap off the kind of climax of our episode here. I really think that the episode probably should have just ended here, but we did get some scenes following this, some scenes between Alicent, Alicent ultimately seeing uh, Aegon, her son, 
absolutely bawling his eyes out in his grief in his room, and then finally going and seeing Kristen Cole once again. These two, Allison and Kristen, are really the kind of poster child for the toxic relationship. This kind of relationship that they know is bad for one another in a plethora of ways, but just like a drug, they just can't seem to quit one another. And this is where our episode ends. Another absolutely banger episode from House of the Dragon. The showrunners are doing an absolutely amazing job with this show, in my opinion. I love all of the little creative flourishes that they're adding, to all these little stories and characters that they're fleshing out more from the book Fire and Blood. Um, and I just think it's I think it's great. I think that this is uh, this show, House of the Dragon, is really awesome because Fire and Blood, being a kind of historical text within the Game of Thrones universe, gives us the broad roadmap, gives us the details for the many events that happened in the Dance of the Dragons, but it's not detailed enough, so it allows these showrunners and the writers to really kind of make these fun, creative flourishes, really flesh out these characters in these episodes. Again, big fan of this show. This episode was easily like a 7.5 and 8 out of 10 for me. It was just absolutely great. I think that the, this uh, series as a whole, House of the Dragon, is just going to be an absolute banger again i've said this so many times we don't have to worry about them fucking up the ending of this show because we know ultimately how this story ends because it is a history of westeros a history of the targaryens and this targaryen civil war I, I can't wait for next week's episode this show is absolutely amazing game of thrones is back baby and it is better than ever let me know your thoughts of this episode in the comment section down below did you like it did you not like it what was your favorite moment what moment did you not like if you did enjoy this video learn something new please make sure you like comment and subscribe because that is the easiest way to help support me and to put this video into the algorithm if you did enjoy this video then why don't you check out some of our other game of thrones content like our season one speed run to get you up to date for everything in season two or our uh, review and breakdown of everything that happened in episode one, season two of House of the Dragon. As always, guys, thank you so much for continuing to support me. I hope to see you in the next one. Drink your water, hug your mother. Until next time, stay safe out there. Peace. Love. I do.